This is my interview with science fiction writer Ken McLeod, who is uh, particularly popular in left libertarian circles, although you don't have to have those political sympathies to uh, find his works uh, interesting. I, uh, I think I've read all his books except the two most recent ones. So I've read everything up through the Corporation Wars. Um, uh, I actually intended to ask him in this interview more questions about his science fiction. I got distracted about asking questions about uh, about politics, uh, but hopefully we can have a rematch and talk about some more things. Uh, one interesting feature of his science fiction is uh, that there are allusions and references and in jokes throughout, uh, particularly like in his first in his first series, the Fall Revolution. Virtually every page has some kind of of in joke or illusion or reference or something, um, which he just throws in there, you know, knowing that not everyone's going to get all of them because uh, you know some of them, uh, some of them will be more likely to get if you come from a British Trotskyist background, and some of them will be more likely to get if you come from a free market libertarian background, and some of them are scientific concepts, and some of them are philosophical concepts and so forth, and some of them are just literary illusions. Um, uh, but it's, you know, uh, I've occasionally, you know, fantasized about, uh, you know, coming up with some, uh, you know, with some guide to that series in particular, just, uh, you know, tracking all the illusions of the pages, but, but, uh, you know, had I whirled enough in time, I might do that. Uh, anyway, uh, when I recorded this video, and uh, not unlike an idiot, I recorded it to the cloud rather than to my computer. So when I downloaded it from the cloud, one result of that was, for some reason, it recorded in speaker view rather than the usual side-by-side -side view. So you're not going to see us side-by-side. -side. You're going to see whoever's talking at the moment, which is not, you know, which is not the uh, um, the ideal way uh, to do this. But uh, you know, let there be a lesson to me to be to be more careful uh, about how I'm recording. Anyway, here comes the interview. Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. Uh, today, I'm pleased to have with me uh, Ken McLeod, a science fiction writer. I have, uh, uh, he's a, um, uh, there's some info on him. He's a two-time BSFA award winner, a three-time Prometheus award winner, a former writer in residence at the University of Edinburgh's Genomics Forum, a former writer in residence at Edinburgh Napier University's Creative Writing and May Program, he taught science fiction writing workshops at Moniac Moore in Scotland, Arvon in England, and Clarion West in the US. Uh, he's published, the books he's published include the Fall Revolution series in four volumes, the Engines of Light series in three volumes, the Corporation Wars series in three volumes, the Web, Cydonia, Newton's Wake, Learning the World, The Highway Men, The Execution Channel, Intrusion, The Human Front, Descent, Selkie Summer, and a book of poems with Ian Banks, and many short stories as well as nonfiction articles. His short story, The Surface of Last Scattering, was the basis for the short film Scattered, and I'll provide a link to that and to all these things in the description. And he blogs at kenmcleod.blogspot.com. Here I am again later, and somehow I left out uh, a couple of novels, uh, The Night Sessions, and the restoration game, because I'm apparently unable to read a list of things I have written for myself uh, when I'm recording these things. But anyway, uh, uh, it is now included. Uh, so welcome. And uh, I'd start by asking about your background, about growing up and how you got interested in 
science fiction and radical politics and uh, the various things that occupy your mind. Yeah, thanks for having me, Roderick. Um, I think we've kind of been in touch remotely for a number of years now. Um, I'm not quite sure in what forums other than your blog, but anyway, we vaguely know each other. Um, so <clears throat> my background, I was born in on the Isle of Lewis, which is off the northwest coast of Scotland. And when I was 10, my family moved to Greenock, which is very near where I am now. Uh, Greenock it was at that time an industrial town on the Firth of Clyde, a large um, estuary on the west coast of Scotland and the main outlet from Glasgow to the sea. And the move from a very, a very distinctively highland, uh, what, what we used to call them, I think, we didn't even call the places we lived in villages that were called settlements, um, which is a, basically a scatter of houses over a hillside. Sometimes, a, how, sometimes you get houses within a few hundred meters of each other. You know, they were, it was quite, quite a, a, a rural place. And my father was a minister of religion. He was a, he was a, a preacher and he, he uh, got a call from the congregation he had on the Isle of Lewis to the congregation in Greenock. And we, and his, <laughs> my then I think six brothers and sisters moved from, from Lewis to Greenock when I was at the age of about 10. And I, I kind of dramatized this experience in my novella, The Human Front by turning everything upside down. So it made the father a, a doctor rather than a minister and so on. Uh, but the, you went from uh, uh, this, not, not backward, I would say, but certainly rather strange society of the Isle of Lewis to uh, what was then a very, very heavy industrial town which had one of the biggest IBM factories in Europe. It had uh, its own, it had a, a huge sugar refinery. It had a huge um, metal box factory. It had a Playtex factory. It had, you know, it was, it was a thriving industrial town heavily with quite a lot of air pollution because people burned coal in their fireplaces. Um, and so on. So it was a, a drastic change. And uh, uh, that, that's how I grew up, where I, where I grew up. And um, after going to university at Glasgow University, I went to London to do further study and eventually went, lived in, worked in IT uh, after failing to become a scientist for reasons I'll explain in a moment. And I, um, then with my family, by that point, uh, we moved to Edinburgh in about 1990. And it was round about then that I started making a very serious effort to write my first novel. To recap on how I got interested in science fiction and as you said, on radical politics, I suppose like many um, people who go on to become science fiction readers, let alone writers, you <laughs> it happens round about your early teens. And I know that as a younger child, I had read what I would, in retrospect, identify as science fiction, but I didn't think of it as anything different from um, other kinds of boys' adventure stories. I read, I was at one of these kids who was a voracious reader, actually. I, I simply read everything. Um, we, you can imagine my mother had been a teacher before she got married and my father was a preacher and he was one of those people who acquires a library by buying um if he'd find one book in a lot at an auction that was interesting to him he'd, he'd buy the lot and take them all home so we had a 
you know, back rooms and attics, piles of complete um, junk of literature, you know, <laughs> all sorts of things. And uh, I, I, would, I read all, all kinds of stuff when I was, when I was a kid. And, um, but when I, when I, when I was, I guess, 10 or 11 or 12 or so, I read a book out of the junior library called Rocket to Limbo by Alan E. Nurse. He was, a quite, was at that time quite a famous writer and he was particularly well known for writing what are now called, well, they're not what is now called YA, they were then called juveniles, like Heinlein juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote SF for young people and- I know his Rocket name, I can't recall if I've read anything by him, but I do know the name. Yeah, yeah. The point about, sorry to ramble a bit, the point about Rocket to Limbo was that it introduced me to the entire range of, virtually the entire range of Golden Age Campbellian SF uh, tropes, generation ships, faster than light travel, <laughs> telepathy, <laughs> psi powers, and all of that. And I was completely, you know, I thought, wow, I want more of this. So I, so I then, um, started reading more extensively and I read all of his books and lots of Heinlein juveniles. And then I got on to the adult library and found yet more SF. And by my mid-teens, I, I was doing what every, certainly every um, British SF writer of my age, which is my, I'm in my 60s, probably a bit younger, my age and younger, will talk about looking for the gaunt SF hardbacks in the library these had a yellow dust jacket, a yellow spine, and had SF on the spine. So we worked our way through, you know, Asimov, Budris, Blish, Brunner, Clark, all the way through to Zelazny. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, got, we got them all. And so I, I read them. And like a, a lot of people, I... I tried to write science fiction or tried to write stories, but the main effect of reading all this science fiction, I think, was that you, I, I got the idea that what I really wanted to be was a scientist. And this was a very bad move on my part because I was, uh, as you can imagine from being a science fiction reading child, I was a, a teenager. I was one of those um, kids who, does really well at subjects like English and history and all that sort of thing, but um, really struggles with mathematics and um, physics and so on. But nevertheless, I persisted. Um, so I, I ended up doing a zoology degree. <clears throat> However, I mean, it stood me in good stead, um, although, um, my, I, I, I think I, I learned a lot out of it, but I, I think it, it's probably a mistake to, if, you, if you're a science fiction reader to think that means you're necessarily going to be particularly good at science. The other question about radical politics, I guess in a way, I mean, we can talk about what was going on socially at, at the time. This was the, the late 60s, early 70s. And there were a great, a great deal of upheavals were going on in Britain and in Europe, and as you recall, in the United States. And naturally, you are sort of influenced by that kind of ferment. Um, I would have read, for instance, I read Malcolm X's autobiography when I was still at high, high school. I probably read Soledad Brother about that time too, by George Jackson, um, books like that. And I think I got interested, I was, you know, I guess in my early teens, I was a fairly conservative teenager. And I, I think I was jolted out of that partly by things that were going on and partly by um, 
I think the first story I ever read that gave me the idea that things that, you know, different ways of having society ordered um, were possible, were conceivable, was a short story by Paul Anderson called The Last of the Deliverers, which is just about, a, I mean, it's, a, it's a set in a future America where in, it's basically a, a market anarchist future America. It, the, uh, yeah, we had, he had, I'm not sure whether he was a full-fledged one, but he was, he had sympathies to market anarchism, I know. Yeah, I guess so. So it's what a, a very cheap source of power has enabled people to be dispersed and self-sufficient, but still technologically advanced enough to have um, federations that launch expeditions to Venus and all that. And the last Republican in town is going on and on, an old man, eccentric old man who bangs on about the wonders of um, the division of labor and mass production factories. He encounters the last Soviet type communist who wanders into town and the two old men have a, have a fight and end up killing each other. And both of their ideologies have been rendered irrelevant. And I am, um, I thought that was a, you know, it really started me thinking. And then, you know, as, as, as one does, um, you encounter some forms of Marxism and uh, start looking into that. I got into dreadful fights with my parents over, over that when I was a student. And um, we eventually came to a kind of agreement that I wouldn't get politically active while I was, before I got my degree, which I'd rather, um, reluctantly agreed to. Um, but at Glasgow University in the 70s, there was a, a quite thriving and active left that did a lot of um, on-campus activity and educational stuff. And you could go and listen to lectures by people who became quite well-known and distinguished, but who already were. Um, if you, in my novel, I think it's, yeah, in the, in the Stone Canal and another one, the Sky Road, there are allusions to that period. And which, I mean, basically, I think gives some of the atmosphere. So when I went, when I was, became a postgraduate and was down at Brunel University in the west of London, uh, fat, the, the outer fringe of London, um, I did become politically active and uh, I was a member of a small far left group for a number of years and got involved in various um, campaigns and you know in Brunel University at that time was had a lot of overseas students including Iranians and Iraqis and Jordanians and Palestinians and so on, so, and Turks. So you got a lot of people who were very serious political people from pretty repressive regimes. You know, um, one of my enduring memories from Brunel is when the Iranian revolution started in 1978, we had, the organization I was in, had a section in, in Iran, and certainly among Iranian exiles, and we had literature in Persian. And one day, two of them came to the campus with a stack of this literature, and people that we'd never thought of as political or had ever encountered before were, you know, coming up and, you know, grabbing it. We shifted stacks of this stuff, um, just an analysis of what was going on in Iran and the prospects of the revolution and all of that. So it was lived through um, pretty intense, you know, you might think Brunel University, ha, a little campus on the west 
west of London. But it was, you know, quite a, there were a lot of cross currents internationally there. So in the end, yeah, I got disillusioned with that for reasons we needn't go into and leave it at that. But I, I got into um, writing seriously, I think, after I had finally finished my thesis and I, which was an MPhil thesis, it's not a doctorate, so it, it, it didn't open many more doors. It gave me the satisfaction of having completed this bit of research and paid my debt to society. And I, I um, found, much to my surprise actually, that I was actually pretty good at programming. I was amazed when I breezed through an aptitude test and got got um, on you know got a, a, a position as a trainee at a London Electricity, which was the main um, well, it's self-explanatory what it was. It was at that time the monopoly supplier of electricity in London, the London Electricity Board. And I was there in the late, <clears throat> in the 80s. And the 80s were a wonderful time for programmers. <coughs> because Margaret Thatcher had unleashed the market in the city of London. She de essentially deregulated the city, the financial sector and the British economy with what was called the Big Bang. And this created a sort of tornado, um, an area of low pressure into which every programmer kept, they kept pulling in programmers and anybody with IT experience got drawn off to the city, which meant that the companies that, and organizations that needed programmers were very willing to recruit and train new people. And um, there was quite an upward pressure, or if you like, on programmer pay and conditions and so on. So we you know, were pretty well off. And at the end of the 80s, we moved, my wife and I decided we wanted to move back to Scotland and did and moved to Edinburgh. And around about 1987, I started writing my first novel and I think I completed it in about 1994, The Star Fraction, where I sort of went through all my, tried to address um, all the things that, had, that I had been trying to think about, about the fall of the socialist bloc and so on. Does that answer your question? <laughs> in those, in those um, your books, and you know, particularly thinking about like the 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 original series, the Fall Revolution, uh, you've got characters and societies that are Trotskyist and free market anarchist and communist anarchist. It's interesting that unlike a lot of political novels, it's not the case that some of them presented you know utopia and some of them presented as you know awful and bad, but you know. Uh, you've got this um, this mixture. Uh, how did you end up coming to uh, coming to find sort of you know interesting positive and negative aspects of so many different flavors of radical politics? Oh, <clears throat> well, excuse me. That that came, I think, after I stopped being <laughs> properly politically active. Um, and in the 1980s, I encountered, first of all, I encountered the Libertarian Alliance quite by accident. The Libertarian Alliance, which in some form still exists, was a group of minimal statists and um, anarcho-capitalists with some kind of the usual kind of mysterious financial backing that had a bookshop in Covent Garden called the Alternative Bookshop, which is the most gobsmacking place I'd ever wandered into. I had, I had been a member, I had joined um, our oldest secular humanist organization, the National Secular Society, because I, again, I happened to come across the bookshop, which is quite near where we lived. <clears throat> and the, their venerable journal, The Freethinker, they, they, the guy who worked in the shop 
asked me, I wouldn't mind dropping off a bundle at this shop in Covent Garden, where it was near where I worked. So I did. And I <clears throat> walked into this shop that had, you know, works by von Mises, by Ayn Rand, who I'd encountered before. And um, uh, things like a badge with a poppy on it and the slogan legalize heroin, which at the time I found just inconceivably outrageous. Because the funny thing is that although I, <clears throat> I had the usual um, at the time kind of countercultural attitude about drugs, that soft drugs, that you know, cannabis and so forth had been unfairly demonized and were pretty harmless. You could, it was only common sense that they should be legal, but that of course heroin should be illegal. Good grief, allowing people to poison themselves. How can you do that? So I was, you know, absolutely fascinated by, you know, shocked and fascinated. And um, I started talking to the, the guys who worked there, um, the late Chris T, who was an extremely dynamic character. I, um, I, I know I, I, I went, I'm not familiar with the ins and outs of li organized libertarian um, factional beefs and so on. Well, um, <laughs> and I know he didn't. Well, they're as bad not, as the <laughs> yes, 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 just as bad. Um, <clears throat> and so I, you know, had a quite frank discussion with them. I said, look, I'm a Marxist, uh, and, but I, I do kind of understand the idea that you could denationalize the state, as it were. And he said, oh, yes, anarcho capitalism. Yes, that's what we call it. Um, <clears throat> and we had a very long conversation just where he expanded what their ideas were. And um, I realized that they weren't. They weren't the kind of people that I'd hitherto come across defending capitalism. I mean, when you're when you're gr growing up, certainly in a society like Britain was in the sixties and seventies, there are there is roughly a left, which is you know goes from the near to the far left, if you like, and there are. The Tories, who are these, you know, very dyed in the wool, probably a bit racist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and um, reactionary in every social respect, and so on. And even at the university, the the conservatives tended to be, you know, braying Tory boys with. Um, I think the Hang Mandela T-shirts came a bit later, but you get the, you get the idea. <laughs> pretty pretty obnoxious character, uh, and to my to my, you know to my mind at the time anyway, I wouldn't have had the time of the day for them. But you know these guys were interesting and obviously had thought thought things out. And I was I became quite intrigued by the economic calculation argument, which was made by ironically enough was made by. A, popularized and the version that I saw it was written by a guy called David Ramsey Steele, who came from Scotland and who um, was in the 60s, a member of the, a very purist organization called the Socialist Party of Great Britain, which is a very, which was founded in 1903 and still exists with its principles unchanged, mm -hmm. although it's, um, and, they have always argued that you could move straight from where we are now to um, a completely moneyless, uh, classless, stateless, etc., society, as long as you convinced enough people of the feasibility of it, <clears throat> which, you know, 
saves you a lot of thought about tactics and strategy and what demo to go to and what cause to support because they don't support any of them. The, they're like pure propagandists. And I guess Steele had, he, he, he became intrigued. He, he recounts how he became intrigued by the economic calculation argument because he saw it as a decisive objection to this kind of socialism. And he elaborated it in, um, first in a thesis and then in a, a book which came out in, in 1990 or 91 called From Marx to Mises, mm -hmm. which I have and I've read more than once. And so I was intrigued by this. And at the same time, of course, in the 80s, you got market reforms in the socialist countries. So you had, and then the rapid disintegration of the communist regimes. So it, it all gave me a lot to think about. Um, the, and I put all, not all that, but a, quite a lot of that into the star fraction. So uh, what are you working on now? I, I'm, at the moment I'm in the editing stage of a, the first volume of a trilogy, a space opera trilogy. Um, after I wrote my last space opera trilogy, I swore I'd never write another. In fact, after I wrote my first space opera trilogy, I'd swore I'd never write another. And now I'm on to my third. Um, this one, uh, it's the provisional, it, uh, unfortunately I keep rethinking the provisional title, but the, the basic idea of it is that um, faster than light travel has becomes available in the relatively near future. And like in this century, it was just something that um, struck me as something that might be a, a crazy cool idea. And I, I know that in a sense, faster than light travel is almost certainly impossible. But I, I also thought that perhaps, um, came I up with a, yet another bogus rationalization for faster than light travel, which I don't think, it's one that I don't think has been done before. And um, of having it with fairly recognizable uh, extensions of the main power blocks of the world we live in, suddenly all getting that and going out into, out among the stars, had lots of intriguing possibilities. So that's what I'm doing. And when you have, uh, you know, when you have a set of political sympathies that finds a lot of aspects of traditional radical socialism attractive and also finds aspects of free market libertarianism attractive. So it's sort of broadly in the same space that I and a lot of my gang are in. Um, the question is, what does that translate into in terms of, of practical politics in the present, which is something that people with that set of interests have a lot of disagreements about? Um, well, you know, I would <laughs> hate to be here under false pretenses. I, I am, you know, in a way, neither of these. I'm, I would, in terms of practical politics, um, I'm a member of the Labour Party, you know, it's mm. just the, I have no, I have no um, objection to um, having, you know, certain utilities and monopolies and land and so on nationalized and having other things privatized. It's a bit like Deng Xiaoping. 
whatever catches mice. And I mean, I, I have a t time has been tempted to define myself for maximum annoyance as a right wing communist, which is not really very helpful. Um, so yeah, on, on how that kind of, I mean, I, I actually did kind of try many years ago to try and figure it out and would you not not my present political position it was a lot more moderated this sort of <coughs> uh, uh, what somebody described uh, yeah i know who it was actually gwyneth jones the english um i guess of anyway british uh, critic and author she described um one of my novels as hard left libertarian which I was quite nice um the sounds like the opposite of right-wing communists but it's still yes yes exactly yes yeah um i you know i've always been you know when i say i wasn't politically active for many years i've you know, been active as a sort of food soldier and all sorts of things notably you know uh, you know the anti-war movement uh, from the invasion of afghanistan through the invasion through yugoslavia iraq etc etc and i followed the american website antiwar.com in fact i still do um i used to take great delight in reading justin raimondo's um editorials however um wrong-headed some of his positions might have been he was certainly a very forceful writer and i'm a bit of a sucker for forceful writers um an engaging uh, character and certainly very hard working and I, I honestly thought there was a kind of area in which you know left-wing anti-imperialism and um american isolationism could be tactically at least on the same page and i'm afraid of come to regard that as a bit naive. I mean, individually, tactically, maybe yes, but I th think I've come to see, um, to, uh, come to be quite dubious about the um, market, free market libertarianism, because it always, and I'm sure you could say mutatis mutandis, the same thing back at me, but I, t I tend to find it as too much of an outrider of the more conventional right, which um, I've come to <laughs> substantially mistrust, shall we say. And one of the things, you know, one of the things that happens when you're on, I was online from, oh, I don't know, in, I think it was in the 19, early 90s, mid 90s, that I first went online and discovered the wonderful crazy world of Usenet, which for any younger viewers was the original social media. Well, not quite the original, but one of the early forms of social media. And some of the some of the libertarians that I used to fence with on there and sometimes agree with on there went on to um what is now called the alt-right and neo-reactionaries i and this experience actually went into um my last space of trilogy, the corporation wars yeah yeah because when i encountered um nick lands on Scott, Scott, I think it's, it's Scott Alexander wrote the anti-reactionary FAQ. That's an online thing. And the other one was Nick Land's <laughs> reactionary FAQ, um, the Dark Enlightenment. And when I read the Dark Enlightenment, I could see exactly where these guys were coming from. Um, you know, people who had started out, in his case, he didn't, but he was anatomizing people who had, who had started out with a libertarian position and then 
found themselves going more and more over to the dark side. And you can see the, you can see the roots of it in, um, in some, of, some versions, at least, of anarcho-capitalism, like Hans Hermann Hoppe, who has this very aristocratic idea of what a free society would be like. Um, yeah, I've got a I've got a piece on him coming out that's called, what's it called? Something like, I forget the title, but it's uh, the um, the you know, the nationalist tribalism of Hans Hermann Hoppe or something like that. Um, uh, you know, so I mean, for a while I was allied with some of those uh, folks, but there was for a long time there was a, um, you know, I think for a long time there was a, and this is a way of of phrasing it, I think, that comes from this guy named Adam Bates online, um, that for a long time there were two different kinds of people or two different kinds of reasons people got involved in libertarianism that didn't initially obviously. Uh, the differences between them weren't obvious and then they became obvious, which is people who are in it because they wanted liberation for everybody and people were in it because they wanted liberation for them and pe themselves and people like them. Obviously, initially, you could see a lot of, of commonalities. You could see that they would have a lot of common fights and so forth. But over time, it became more and more clear that uh, things were going on different uh, trajectories. And the people who were primarily interested in, in uh, liberation for themselves and people you know, who were like them in some sort of tribal way uh, we're moving off in, in directions of, of uh, nationalism and uh, social conservatism and uh, you know, various, um, you know, various weaker and stronger versions of you know, ultimately fascism, really. Um, whereas people for whom it was always about liberation for everybody were going off in a different direction. So I think the, you know, the libertarian movement is, I think, much more polarized than it was um, say 20 years ago. Um, yeah. The way I think it's a good thing, you know, because we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're recognizing we're not all on the same page and we are heading in different, you know, and of course within the, each of those factions, within each of those camps, there's lots of disagreements too, but, um, but the, uh, you know, the people who are in it, um, uh, you know, primarily because they, you know, resented government control of their, or, you know, because they, you know, they wanted to have their own ethnic enclaves or whatever bullshit they wanted. Uh, it, it just becomes clear that it's just it's not the same set of motivations. 
Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, you know, bid them a happy farewell, uh, as uh, you know, as um, uh, Greta Garbo says in Anochka about the the Stalinist uh, mass trials that are going to be fewer but better Russians. Uh, well, in this case, you know, I think, uh, you know, if I, I'm happy to speed these people out of the libertarian movement, let them go off in the, into the uh, crazy alt right, get out of our, get out of our spaces. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's a, you know, someone who gets interested in, uh, in libertarian ideas and then as a result gets, you know, gets hooked, you know, it's, it's important then, you know, what the next thing is that they associate that with and uh, get hooked onto. So, um, so a lot of those people started, more, started moving more openly right. At the same time that I and some of my friends were moving more to sort of the left end of libertarianism. So we, uh, you know, so there's, you know, there's been sort of a broadening uh, gap there. Yeah, now that, that, really interesting because I have um, tried to understand some of these intellectual genealogies and they're the, if you take classical people talk about classical liberalism and you know, lots of quite um, people that, you know, you and I would probably unite in scoffing at would call themselves classical liberals. Um, but the only classical liberal that I'm, I wouldn't say f even superficially familiar with was John Stuart Mill. And I think, you know, John Stuart Mill's text on liberty remains a a permanent acquisition of human thought. Um, likewise, you know, many of the other, uh, some of the, the great liberal works and some of the libertarians, um, for example, um, is it George H. Smith, the guy who wrote Atheism, The Case Against God, mm -hmm. and Atheism, Ayn Rand and other heresies. He was a, a kind of, more free thinking Randian, but he certainly um, was very much aware of the full range of the liberal tradition and radical liberal tradition. And um, the late Chris Tame was fantastically interested in that. I mean, he was probably at, at the time in Britain he was had more classical liberalism in his head and in his library than um, entire university departments. Like he compiled, I think, a bibliography of classical liberal thought, which you can probably, I think you can find online. I think Sean Gabb made it available. And it is a phenomenal piece of, research. Um, he also did specialized works in the land, on the land question on Georgism. And I, oh, the other one, the other great classical liberal, a somewhat cantankerous character, but still fascinating, Herbert Spencer, one of the most maligned philosophers that I can think of. And he, um, did, he did have some you know, some, some cantankerous views, but he certainly didn't, you know, he certainly wasn't the, you know, he certainly didn't have the sort of the stereotypical view that everyone attributes to him that, uh, you know, we should just let the poor and weak die off in order to improve the, the species and so forth. I mean, he, he said over and over again that that wasn't what he meant, but, but everyone just sort of rolls on. Yes, yes, yes. He, he did get more conservative in his later years. Um, but even in his later years, he was still saying, you know, that the wage system is a vestige of slavery and that, uh, you know, something like workers cooperatives is going to be an improvement, which of course is you know, along the same lines that John Stuart Mill was moving towards as well. Um, yeah. 
Oh, and his, of course, his, although people think of him as being sort of more at the right wing end of libertarianism, obviously his views on land were, uh, you know, were um, similar to George's and though not similar enough that it prevented George from writing an attack on him. Um, Perplexed but, philosopher, yes. Um, and of course, uh, you know, then there's sort of the 19th century individualist anarchists. Uh, yeah, one of one of the main characters in the Fall Revolution uh, is a fan of Benjamin Tucker. Uh, um, and, you know, the works of those guys who combined uh, free markets with labor radicalism and land reform and uh, feminism and uh, various things. Um, and they saw these all as interconnected, uh, uh, different kinds of, they saw all these different forms of oppression sort of mutually uh, reinforcing. Um, and they're sort of a big inspiration for uh, folks in, in my circles. Yes. Well, fights with each other too, of course. Yeah. Um, the question that does come back is how does that relate to actual politics is one of the things I'm very, very conscious of is that there's a big difference between finding intellectually fascinating um, lines of thought and, and tradition and I'm very, um, very, well, very much alive to that, but also very much um, <laughs> in a way, I know that I'm kind of easily over fascinated by that. That there's a big difference between that and relating to practical politics. And unfortunately, we do seem to be in a situation where there is still pretty much a class polarization of society and where what you might call state monopoly capitalism is the only kind and that I, I do think that the only way to deal with these huge concentrations of interlocking um, state and private and corporate power and their ideological and propaganda apparatuses and so on is to do what you can to build up a counter power from below, that, albeit, but that one that at some point does have to try whether by election or in, in some possibly conceivable circumstances not but you know to become the government and i think that the kind of anarchist libertarian type um reluctance to go into politics leads either to uh, ineffectuality on the one hand or, or opportunism on the other. Um, now, I'm, I am not um, necessarily excluding myself from this criticism, but uh, do, you, do you understand what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, they had those debates too. I mean, they debated every possible strategy from you know, focus on purely education to grassroots organizing to violent revolution to electoral politics and if so what kind of electoral politics and and what to do and how um uh you know they debated all those things and tucker himself shifted a bit over the course of his career he became more pessimistic about the um about the ability of markets to break up 
corporate power without some kind of uh, government intervention uh, by contrast with his earlier views. But, you know, as often happens, you know, when, uh, when, a thing, you know, when an influential thinker shifts their views, they don't bring all their followers with them. And so you end up fight, between fights between sort of the, you know, the, you know, the proponent, the followers of the early guy and the followers of the later guy, just as, you know, you have this conflict between the followers of the, you know, the early Rothbard when he was more lefty and the followers of the later Rothbard and so forth. Um, yeah. And within, you know, within my own circles, there's a, there's a division of opinion on, on uh, whether to be involved in, um, in uh, sort of electoral politics uh, or not. Um, there are, you know, some would think that it's, that it's, uh, it's counterproductive and the best thing to do is to try and build alternative institutions. There are others who think, no, you know, it's a form of, you know, it's a form of uh, self-defense that the elected elections are what you do while you're building the revolution. You have to, you have to be doing something else to fend things off. Though in my circles, pretty much everyone agrees that, that the, the libertarians who, who thought supporting Trump was a good idea were crazy. Uh, yeah, so that there's in my circle. Well, it depends how you define my circles. If we define my circles as you know, sort of people I still have some friendship or association with, and some of them are pro-Trump libertarians, I'm sad to say. Uh, but um, if you know that people sort of that I'm you know, that I'm associated with in some stronger sense of uh, working with uh, politically, uh, we pretty much all see Trump as a, an unmitigated disaster. Um, well, I guess he's a mitigated disaster because everything's almost everything is, except you know the end of the universe would be. Well, even that probably would have its positive side. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's it really is. These last few days really does seem like we're living in a science fiction novel. This, uh, you know, I mean, you know, we all had our fantasies about people seeing, you know, seeing, uh, you know, the storming of Congress, but this wasn't the context we had imagined. <laughs> <laughs> It's um yes, it's my my first thought seeing it was that it looked very like a what you tend to see in post post Soviet countries or tended to see in post Soviet countries. It was like live by the color revolution, die by the color revolution. Um, um the and you know I, I don't know if I'm while, as it were, while, while we've been talking, some other astonishing development hasn't taken place. Things are obviously in a, in a pretty, um, it, it is a pretty scary situation, at, you know, even right now, even though that uh, a coup attempt or whatever you want to call it has evidently failed, but uh, there's a heck of a lot of um, sources of instability at the moment, and aren't going to all go away once the, you know, once the uh, once Trump is definitively out. Yeah, and then we'll, all we're left with is the pandemic and the economic crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I was going to say one strange intellectual and artistic debt that I have to the libertarians was a, I think it's some online piece that David Friedman wrote against Hans Hermann Hoppe. And Hans Hermann Hoppe had come up with an argument that would you, I think he called the argument from argument Yes, I've written about that too. <laughs> and and um, Friedman said, oh, to, to summarize the argument very, very briefly, as, as I understand what Hoppe was saying was that in order to argue, you have to accept some right of property in yourself and in whatever you're arguing on, whether it's a space to speak or people to write on and all that. And Friedman managed to demolish that 
pretty well. I mean, for one thing, he pointed out that you could have, you could be a monk who owns absolutely nothing and still be writing Thomist philosophy in your cell, or indeed in your university, without owning a, the rags on your back, let alone the pen on the paper. Um, but what Friedman said was, in, in a, almost in passing in this essay, was imagine a world where people have no rights at all, but most people are able to pretty effectively defend defend um, their positions and their positions, as it were. So it's it's a kind of war, war of all against all, <laughs> where no rights are recognised, but nevertheless they're kind of enforced. And then he says something like, "How." how different is this from the world we live in? <laughs> that really got me thinking. And I think that was the root of um, my novel, The Cassini Division, where people actually try and turn that into an actual uh, philosophy of... Yeah, sort of the egoistic communist anarchism of... Yes. Uh, ...of uh, Earth at that point in, in history. Yeah. Can you excuse me a moment? For, well, I'm going to try and wave to my friend. But uh, oh, uh, that's a nice view. Idea. Just show you the view. That's lovely. Yeah. Um, I, I happen to see uh, my brother-in-law and his wife walking past, but they missed me. But anyway, you've got to, you've got, you, you know what the now know what the Firth of Clyde looks like. Ah. Oh. Yeah, I knew you were near the Firth of Clyde, but I didn't know that you were, you know, that you were right, you know, right on it. Uh, you could see it out the window. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's well, inspired. When you lived before, sort of the other, the other side of Scotland, um, uh, you were by the Firth of Forth, then, right? Um, yes. And could you see it that out the window too? Not, not so. We weren't so close to the water. We were higher up the hill, and there was a there were a lot of trees in the way. But in the winter, you could certainly see the, the Firth of Forth and the, the ships going down it. And we were in between the two famous, well, actually, we were between, we we're very close to the Forth Road Bridge, a mile or so from the rail bridge. And just before we moved away from there, they had completed the third bridge, the Queensferry Crossing, which is, um, the third one yeah yeah so it's a yeah, that, that may not have been there when i was there no when were you in edinburgh um early 2000s all right pity i missed you <laughs> maybe 2004 or thereabouts i'm gonna forget which right uh, my family originally came from that area, uh, uh, or from Kirkcaldy. At least I had ancestors from Kirkcaldy. All right. Yeah, so we the, went over and visited the uh, Kirkcaldy homestead, which my mother's reaction was, you know, why would they live here where I think they could just cross the Firth and live in Edinburgh? <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't that impressed by Kirkcaldy. Uh, birthplace of Adam Smith. And Gordon Brown. Uh, and Gordon Brown, yes. I had a, I had the great delight a couple of years ago in standing beside David Brin for a selfie at the statue of Adam Smith in the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. Um, the yeah, and there's also a statue that I'm very uh, I feel a great affection for on, on the Royal Mount, the statue of David Hume. When I was there, someone had taken one of those traffic cones and put it on his head. I don't know whether to symbolize a wizard's hat or a dunce cap. <laughs> <laughs> one yeah, of the up, we also looked up the, uh, the graves of Hume and Smith and uh, Dougal Stewart, I think. Uh, um, 
we wandered around for a while before figuring out that there are two different Colton burial grounds. Uh, well, three if you count Calton Hill. Um, and we hadn't originally realized those were all different, but we. Uh, well, anyway, that was that was a very pleasant trip. We also took a uh, a bus trip up through the through the Highlands. Uh, so we never got to Glasgow, but we uh, we took a, a one day bus trip through the Highlands, and we spent a week in Edinburgh. Another monument on Calton Hill is the only statue of Abraham, the first statue of Abraham Lincoln outside of the Western Hemisphere or outside of the Americas, I forget which, but there is a statue of Lincoln. Um, yeah, Edinburgh is a fascinating and wonderful city and it's got so many associations with the Scottish Enlightenment. You can see, um, because you know, we saw the Walter Scott and uh, Robert Burns, and yeah, and Hutton, James Hutton, who discovered deep time <clears throat> and taught there. That is probably you can, I don't know if anyone has ever identified it, but I've often thought that somebody should find the actual place in Edinburgh University where Charles Darwin, after his first uh, dissection lesson was violently ill <laughs> and decided, <laughs> decided that medicine was not for him. <laughs> and, and it's, it's where, where the, the course of the world changed. Because I guess Darwin could have been a country doctor if he, had, if he hadn't found uh, the smell of formaldehyde to overpower <laughs> Awesome. Our hotel is right next to the, um, or right near the uh, Arthur Conan Doyle monument. Or I guess it was just actually it was a Sherlock Holmes monument, not a. Yes. Oh, yes. So we know, yes, I know the very place. It's um, it's just on a, on a on a corner. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, so my, you know, my family had, uh, you know, but we'd never been there. But my family had. Um, you know, sort of various histories and traditions about uh, and stories about the Firth of Forth and Edinburgh and so forth. So it was kind of a, a homecoming for us and especially for my mother who remembered the stories more than I do. There's a wonderful play, or well, I, the, the conceit of the play is wonderful. I can't, I don't, I've never seen the play or read it. I can't speak for it, but it's about going to America and it's about some people in the slums of Edinburgh who are also, you know, who are, have decided to emigrate to America. And what they think is America is what they can see. They think America is just on the other bank of the force. <laughs> they don't know that they're in for a weeks long sea voyage. They think they're just going to cross the force to Kirkcaldy. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Well, there's a, um, you know, there are several there are several versions of the Statue of Liberty in Paris, and there's one of them where you can see it, and then the um, the Eiffel Tower a little bit behind it. And so, uh, uh, you know, one time I posted that that photo with the caption something like, like uh, you know, don't uh, you know, don't let the airlines charge you a thousand dollars to uh, to travel from New York to Paris. You can just walk walk. <laughs> <laughs> Edinburgh is a bit like that because it's built on two levels. So you, near, certainly around the center of Edinburgh, you can find shortcuts from one place to another, or you can go, go into a building and go down five stories and come out in a different part of town <laughs> entirely. It's, it is, yeah, I mean, I, I like Edinburgh a lot. In the middle uh down where the trains are um yes 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 um stephen baxter wrote uh the science fiction writer stephen baxter wrote a very good book about james hutton with a very clear description of um i think it's called revolutions in the earth or the american edition is called revolutions in the earth and 
it, it has a very clear description of how Edinburgh came to be the shape it is, because a glacier ground over it, ground over the stump of a, a volcanic plug, I think it was. So that great long trail, great long slope of the high street from the castle down to the palace, Hollywood Palace, is in fact the um, rubble that was left by the glacier as it ground off the top of the rock, leaving this great trail down. And or the rock, there's still a lot of rock. I don't, I don't think, no, no, I, I got that slightly wrong, but there's basically it's a very, an almost tear shaped rock that's been left by the glacier. And it, it also means that in Edinburgh and in, in medieval Edinburgh and early modern Edinburgh, you couldn't dig. Uh, you had to, you know, more or less tunnel and mine. So there's nothing, <laughs> it, it was a long time before they got any kind of sewage, sewage or sewerage in. So Edinburgh was notorious as, as the place where people simply tipped their chamber pots out of upper story windows with a cry of guardy <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, we read this and we learned this in childhood history, and I, I thought this was just a, a feature of um, backward <laughs> early modern times, but it was <laughs> distinctive to Edinburgh. Everywhere else, people behaved in a somewhat more civilized fashion. Well, it was oh. theologically driven. Um, I remember when we, we, we walked down, uh, when we got to the Parliament building, there was a woman who'd set up a, a booth in front of there, and she was protesting something or other. I don't remember what her political orientation was, but she was, anyway, she talked to us or, uh, and she said, you know, I used to think that the Scottish government was the most corrupt government in the world, which made me chuckle. And then, but every time everyone from different countries comes by here and they, and when I tell them that, they start telling me about the corruption in the government from whatever country they come from. I'm beginning to think that there are lots of corrupt governments all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Scotland might not be the worst in the world. <laughs> oh, by by no means. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if anyone could even think that. Actually, I mean, it's... Well, I think we've had. She seemed to have led a sheltered existence. <laughs> and to say, I don't remember what political perspective, or I'm not even sure if it was clear what political perspective she was. Uh, you know, she was coming from, but uh, you know, the things that the Scottish Parliament were doing that she thought were were corrupt, but she didn't have a very clear sense of uh, what the international scene looked like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you've written a bit about some uh, um, some other current political issues in in Britain, everything from Brexit to Scottish independence to the you know, anti-vaping laws and so forth. Do you want to say anything about any of those topics? In particular, things like like uh, Brexit and Scottish independence are sort of difficult uh, for sort of libertarian radicals because, at least especially sort of lefty libertarian radicals, because on the one hand, you know, we like decentralization, but we don't like nationalism. We like internationalism, but we don't like centralization. So both options tend to, are ones we tend to feel uncomfortable about. Hey. <clears throat> yeah, there is also the fact that um, the European Union is, uh, was designed to uh, separate markets from political control certainly um, the banks and financial markets. And <clears throat> in many ways, it is quite a neoliberal institution. The, I, I haven't written much about Brexit. I, 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 way back in 2014, 2013, 2014, I, I did write quite a bit on my blog about Scottish independence and on Twitter and so on, because I was, I was quite, uh, I was quite opposed to it. And the, re the reason being not for any particular animus against 
Scotland or any idea that it, it couldn't happen. Um, in fact, I guess uh, I was a, in my teens and 20s, I was something of a left wing nationalist myself to, to a degree, but I I did think one that it was a hugely unnecessary upheaval. And secondly, that I didn't think the Scottish left or the left in Scotland or in working class or working people in Scotland would gain much out of it because of the upheaval and expense of the whole thing. But it was, I have to say that the movement for Scottish independence was a, a, in, around the Scottish referendum was the biggest politicizing event um, of recent history in Scotland for sure. And it galvanized thousands upon thousands of people, probably many more than that actually to act, take, start taking an active part and an active interest in politics. And it completely cut off at the knees, the Labour Party in Scotland. It's very easy now to forget that until about 2010 or so, <coughs> the Labour Party was absolutely dominant in Scotland. Um, they were very surprised to lose the par Scottish parliamentary elections. And in 2015, the map of Scotland, the electoral map of Scotland, which is distorted by the first past the post system, and <coughs> all that, excuse me, <coughs> it went from Labour red to SNP yellow, literally overnight. Um, it's probably the biggest uh, eviction of incumbent politicians that certainly Scotland has ever seen all in one clean sweep. Uh, and this was after the Nationalists lost the referendum, let's not forget. So, heck, I, you know, I, I, I am, uh, as I said, a foot soldier in the Labour Party and I knocked on many, many doors in, in this town and the neighbouring towns in the past couple of years. And a lot of the base, the vote, voter base for the Labour Party has simply decamped en masse to the SNP. There is no question about that. And it's, I think it is just something that we have to come to terms with, what, you know, whoever we are, we have to come to terms with, that there has been a big, a big, big shift in Scottish social political consciousness in the past few years. And the in interesting thing <clears throat> is that it has very little apart from on the fringes, it has very little to do with uh, what we usually think of as nationalism. There's a certain amount of, you know, blue face, blue and white face paint and glorification of Braveheart and all that kind of thing and chart and, but. That very uh, historically accurate movie. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There's, there's very little, um, national cultural obsession. Culturally, Scotland is not that different from England. Um, but, and in many ways to the social and political attitudes, and as you, as you know, um, I don't think for outsiders we're very easy to tell apart. Um, or as I heard uh, one tourist say on the phone, I'm calling from Scotland, Scotland, England. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, we, we often hear Americans doing that. And you know, it doesn't, it doesn't bother us. I mean, I, I like, I sometimes... I one, of the, <laughs> one of the things that was quite a, that suddenly made a lot of things quite clear to me was that 
re realizing something that I already perhaps knew, which was that a large part of Scotland is, is English in the sense that the kingdom, what became the kingdom, the, the lowlands of Scotland, the central lowlands, uh, the Lothians, the east, or the area around Edinburgh was part of um, Northumbria until Northumbria was split by the Norse invasions. So there was a kind of a big chunk of essentially English speaking people who thought of themselves as English in there. And <clears throat> the, the Highlanders certainly regard the uh, Lowlanders as a different nation, you know, a different nation. The Sassan, Sassanich began at Perth, you know, and as far as the, for a long time, right up until the 18th century, um, for many people, most people in central Scotland, um, barbarism, <laughs> civilization ended at Perth. Beyond Perth, it was just the Highlands, which were a, um, a kind of tribal wasteland. Here there be Picts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, except the Picts all that, I don't know, either exterminated or absorbed, I'm not sure which. Um, so my late, my late friend, um, Neil Davidson, I was a Scottish Marxist, wrote several books about Scottish history. One called The Origins of Scottish Nationhood, where he makes the argument that the Scotland only became a united nation after the defeat of the 45 rebellion. And the Highlands were only integrated into, the, became, and began to feel themselves part of the same nation. Um, after that, and uh, I think that's a, a strong point. So <clears throat> the, there's a lot of, like I suppose like all nations, there's a lot of mess and um, half, half understood popular history and, and so on. But Scotland's not an oppressed nation by any means. So for all of these reasons to recap slightly, I, I wasn't particularly keen on um, the idea of Scottish independence, and I didn't think there was much to be gained for it, but I may have been, I mean, I was certainly well out of step with uh, a great many people in, on the Scottish left and in the, in the labor movement, though not all. Um, and we, <clears throat> as, as for Brexit, I voted Remain uh, not out of any great love for the EU, but because leaving the EU on the terms set by the Tories and UKIP and <laughs> people like Nigel Farage and the Tory headbangers was unlikely to be of any great benefit to, to the uh, people of the UK. And, you know, at the moment, Fortunately, or otherwise, it, at least it has not been a, a disaster in that they did get a deal, uh, a trade agreement. Lots of people are suddenly discovering all the inconveniences of having to fill in customs forms, which they've been able to happily ignore for all, all of their lives until that point. Um, so it's created new barriers to trade for sure between Britain and continental Europe. And even between the mainland of the UK and Northern Ireland, which is supposedly part of the UK state, which is part of the UK state, although contestably so. Um, so <coughs> Brexit is a well uh, a rolling snowball. <laughs> unintended consequences. And I, it's possible that it, it, it certainly has increased the level of support for Scottish independence, which has consistently now for at least, uh, I think six, six months of opinion polls have shown a steadily increasing 
support for independence had gone up from about from less than around 48% to um, around about 58, which is a pretty drastic shift. So do, do, do most supporters of independence want to rejoin the EU or not? Um, that that's certainly the, the official SNP pitch. And my, our first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has that position. That, and as long as Britain hadn't actually left, they could always have this idea that, you know, Britain could leave, but Scotland could somehow stay. But Scotland is now out and would have to rejoin. They might get a fast track to rejoining. But on the other hand, a substantial minority of people who support the SNP also voted to leave. So it's, I think it's what's quite possible is that if, you know, barring any further upheavals or whatever, if they did get independence, they might go for the European economic area or the European free trade area, both of which are sort of loosely associated with the European Union, but aren't in it. So you can be in the single market and customs union without being in the EU. Um, whether, as for example, Northern Ireland is now, bizarrely enough. So we'd have a very um, strange, sugarly set of relationships. Sugarly being a Scottish word, <laughs> which I'm sure is, is um, self-explanatory, a, a very shaky and wobbly set of relationships with both England, Ireland and the European continent. And we really don't know how that's going to pan out. By the way, whenever I hear Nicholas Sturgeon's name, uh, it's funny because one of my, my main professors in grad school was Nicholas Sturgeon. Um, and so whenever I hear her name, I think, oh, um, <laughs> has has uh, changed his gender and got involved in Scottish politics <laughs> uh, because they sound you know they, when you say the names fast they sound uh, just like yeah <clears throat> she yes um, there so many the they may even might very well even be related in some distant way, because it is an unusual name. And who knows, um, they, might have a, they might have a recent common ancestor. Yeah, he also <clears throat> found a, a new, or he or someone had found a newspaper clipping uh, uh, where the headline was, Lake Monster turns out to be a giant sturgeon. And he had put that on his door. <laughs> <laughs> the other, the other, um, Political issue I mentioned that is you know, probably less divisive for uh, you know, for libertarians um, is you've been involved a lot in, uh, in talking about uh, anti vaping legislation and more broadly about uh, paternalistic legislation in general because your book Intrusion is a lot about that. Um, yeah. Do you want to say anything about both about you know the the anti vaping issue and you know also on some of the um, the themes of intrusion? All right. Well, intrusion came from, it came, I think it came out of a conversation with my then editor, Darren Nash, after I had been on a panel in London <clears throat> at an event called Battle of Ideas uh, on um, things like IVF and so on. I think it was called Frankenstein, Frankenstein's Daughters, question mark. Something like that about, um, what's the word, neonatal and prenatal technologies or genetic engineering, all that kind of thing. And in the course of a, an evening of brainstorming over Belgian beers, I said to my editor, what if, what if it, was possible to make sure that every child was genetically perfect, but that not doing so counted as child neglect. And he said, you've got to write this. And I was a bit dismayed because it sounded a bit like a kind of anti-vaccination type premise. 
and you know it went through several iterations and before I came on the idea of which my agent a lady called Nick Cheatham emphasized and that was to focus on the mother and the child and build it all around them and <clears throat> One day I, I saw, I saw by chance, I saw a woman who worked in the same office as I was working in at the time, uh, wait, waiting to get in through the door. And something about her hair and the way she dressed and so on reminded me absolutely of a certain type of young mum uh, from the area of London where I had been when I was in London. And I said to my agent, I've seen the mum. I know what she looks like. I know who it is. I know who this person is. So that's one of these things that um, sort of chancy things that ideas and not for novels can come out of. And intrusion is all about uh, the idea of people being compelled to do things ostensibly for their own good. And I had quite a lot of fun um, exploring that uh, premise, including uh, a Labour MP who explains to Hope, the character, that what they have, the system they have, is the free and social market. And it's free because you make your choice, but where the social side comes in is that the government helps you to make the choice that you would have made if you had been fully informed. So <laughs> whether that's the choice you, you actually made or not. And <clears throat> Nudging idea. Yes, yes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about that. Now on the, on vaping, which actually I only took up, I think I took up around about, about sometime after I'd written that novel. I was a long-term smoker. Uh, I smoked cigarettes for a very long time and by chance came across vaping and a student at Napier showed me what a, what a proper e-cig was like. And I went across the hill to the nearest vape shop and got a starter kit that very day. And to my amazement, I, I went from smoking a pack a day to, of cigarettes a day to smoking a pack a month without any effort. And after a few, after I think over a year of occasionally bumming cigarettes off people, I bummed my last cigarette on New Year's Day 2015 or 16, I forget, and haven't smoked a cigarette since. So I was, you know, very, pleased at being able to quit smoking without um, all the unpleasantness of other previous efforts of willpower and all that. And it's, I get a, a decent nicotine kick and keeps me happy and keeps me, lets me concentrate and it isn't offensive to, to anyone else. So I was disappointed, but not surprised to find that <laughs> vaping had become, become a bit of a culture war issue, and in, at least in the US, not here, fortunately, and um, also had uh, lots of people who were in the anti-smoking camp vehemently against it for reasons that have never been entirely clearly explained. But the big disaster for vaping in America happened with uh, the uh, lung injuries that were associated with vaping and turned out very quickly to be due to contaminated THC, cannabis vapes, and nothing to do with the kind of stuff that people vape, you know, nicotine vaping. Um, but, as you probably know, the public health authorities in America were very, very slow to make that distinction clear. And there's a bit, been a bit of a moral panic about the device that's called dual 
Jules, uh, J-U-U-L, which are very easy to use, very easy to conceal, practically undetectable, and are the kind of things that appeal to um, teenagers <laughs> doing things that, that they probably shouldn't. Now, I think it's probably better if they vape than if they smoke. I mean, when I was a teenager, lots and lots of teenagers smoked illegally, but they did. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really think that vaping has the possibility of letting lots of people who are maybe addicted to nicotine move on to a much, much safer form of using it. And it would be a tragedy if this got stopped or even <clears throat> really slowed down by uh, very illiberal legislation and moral panics of one kind or another. There's a lovely science fiction story that I can't find anyone else who seems to have read. It, it by Robert Chase. It's called The Shrieking of the Nightingale, which is a number of works have used that title. Um, so when I search for it, I usually find something else. But uh, it appeared in the early 90s in Analog. And it's about uh, a future in which uh, I mean, the main character is deaf and they're trying to forcibly uh, uh, cure her deafness and also genetically uh, ensure that her children are deaf. And there's sort, of, there's, there's, there's sort of the child abuse arguments that if you don't correct the genetic deficiencies that are going to make your kids uh, deaf, then that's child abuse, or is it? Um, also raises questions about whether deafness should be considered a defect or just a difference. The main character says, look, I don't, you know, I, you don't feel uh, that you're defective because you can't uh, hear the, um, the songs of bats or see the neutrino flux shining through the earth. Um, but uh, you know, the government comes back and says, yeah, but um, if you're living in a world where there are, you know, where there are, you know, you know uh, where there are, um, you know, car horns and train horns and so forth, uh, it's just dangerous uh, for you. And and dangerous to pass this on to your kids and so forth. Uh, so it's a, it's a beautifully written story uh, about this kind of uh, medical paternalism and it's sort of philosophically complex and raises a bunch of different issues. I sometimes assign it to my students, but I don't think it's ever been collected in anything else, even though it, you know, it would be a natural thing to collect. Anyway, so if you haven't read that story, I, I recommend you because you might enjoy it given that uh, no, it's on the issues that you like, but uh, um, no one seems to be aware of it. Well, I, I certainly wasn't, so thanks for the recommendation. Uh, I was, I can't tell, noticing that the sun has long since set in this latitude, <laughs> so I can either interrupt for a moment and put the lights on, or how, when would you like to kind of wind up? We should probably start to wind up because an hour and a half is about as long as a video, uh, uh, I, you know, uh, uh, it's about as long a video as, I mean, it, it, my system is very slow for uploading videos. So if it's too much longer than an hour and a half, it, then it just takes forever. So it's probably best to start you know, winding up now and we can always, you know, we can always have a, you know, have a, a part two sometime if, uh, if uh, if you're willing, um, but anyway, so thanks a lot uh, for coming on. This is um, this has been fun. Um, any last thoughts? No, not really. Thank thank you for having me, and I've certainly been having having fun as as well. It's been really pleasant and relaxing talking with you. Uh, maybe an, another time we could talk more we might uh, find something to talk about about Scotland and you know there's not just the end you know Scotland has so much really interesting history from the point of view of your interests like the 
how, how did um, Scotland go from being a, a place of intense religious fanaticism to being the place of where the Enlightenment, one part of the Enlightenment at any rate, began? What, what Voltaire called the source of all our ideas of civilization. Etc. It's a it's a really interesting story, and you know we can maybe talk about that. But I've really enjoyed this, Roderick, and uh, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'd love to talk about Scottish history, Scottish literature, uh, Scottish geography. Uh, the, the trip through the Highlands was just incredibly beautiful. Uh, really enjoyed that, uh, and we took a boat trip on Loch Ness. And whenever I say I've been on Loch Ness. People always ask me, did you see the monster? As though I wouldn't have led with that. <laughs> but what I will say is either, oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I saw it. Or else, is the Loch Ness Monster supposed to have two heads? And if they say no, then I say, oh, well, I didn't see it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, um, yes, I, I probably know, know know too much about the Loch Ness Monster for my own for my own good mainly that it doesn't exist but it's, <laughs> it's a, a very interesting story so another time for the Loch Ness Monster right now I'll swing you around and cast some light on the thing and show you another Scottish er, Scottish landscape again if you can Lovely. see uh, I haven't got my thumb in the way or anything have I? anyway that's it Another Guruk sunset. <sighs> yeah, because as I mentioned, so, I, my family originally came from there. I've got Mackays and Lockerbies and various people on my my ancestry, most of whom came through uh, uh, Eastern Canada. But anyway, uh, something we can talk about maybe another time. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Farewell. <laughs>